Hello friends! My name is Luke the Gamer Duke. I enjoy playing, dissecting, and talking about video games. Today I'm introducing myself to a brand new ARPG, and that is Last Epoch. I've always been a huge fan of the roguelike ARPGs, or what used to be called dungeon crawlers back in the day, and after seeing the trailers and a couple short gameplay videos, Last Epoch looks like it's right up my alley. Outside of those, I've largely kept myself in the dark to try to figure out as much of my own as possible. I'm also coming at this game from a bit more of a Diablo 2 type perspective. I've dumped a small handful of hours into it so far, getting each character to level 8 and taking the mage to level 16. By no means is this a full review nor my final thoughts, but I would like to express some general first impressions of some things I thoroughly enjoy and some things I'm scratching my head over. What are those things? Let's go find out. I'm going to separate these impressions by aspects of the game, such as story, gameplay, skills, and so forth, and attempt to put all this in some sort of cohesive order. And we'll jump right into the meat and potatoes, the characters. The characters are as straightforward as much as they are different from each other, with the Sentinel, Rogue, Mage, Primalist, and Acolyte all sounding exactly as they're expected to play. The Sentinel is very much your barbarian paladin combo, with armor and hack and slashing being his main theme. He has a seemingly robust playstyle, incorporating heavy melees like Warpath, defensive measures such as Rebuke, and even range skills with Hammer Throw into his arsenal, all of which feel great to use, and are quite lucrative in combat during different types of engagements. Something I appreciate is the fact his melee skill attacks actually use the weapon currently equipped, rather than being some random magical attack. The Sentinel feels like he could be a powerhouse moving forward. The Rogue is your archer or fast slasher type character, which to be honest is kinda my least favorite to play. A lot of her playstyle and skills make sense though, with fast multi-hitters like Cinder Strike and Shurikens, heavy hitters like Puncture, and Shift for dodging, but others such as Acid Flask and Smoke Bomb I found a bit odd to use. All of her weapon related skills seem set up for bow or melee usage, which is great as to not be shackled to either or based on skill choice. She handled mobs just fine but had some trouble with higher damage output. Granted, bow drops were pretty limited. Overall, the first impressions of the rogue were pretty slow going. The mage is exactly the type of character you'd expect. He's a mage. Lightning, ice, and fire is his skill attire. The mage was great to use, from the basics like fireball and elemental nova, defensive skills like snap freeze and mana ward, to his beastlies like Disintegrate and Glacier. All feel awesome every time they cast and connect. Also, with Mana Strike and the Spellblade path, a melee mage sounds quite interesting. I do like there are different animation cycles for casting some of the same spells too. Since I took the mage a bit further, I was able to unlock more of these passive tree skills, and holy shit, these things absolutely destroy. For certain, the mage is a monster with elemental damage. <laughs> the Primalist is basically a Barbarian Druid, and this guy, this guy right here, and his summons for that matter, are absolute tanks. I completely blasted through this first section. I can only imagine what he'll be like in his shifted form. His starting melees are solid, if not a little lackluster, but Fury leaping around, and as far as the eye can see, definitely breaks the melee monotony. His totem flushes out his playstyle a bit more as well, as it actually provides solid damage output. And his wolf can definitely hold his own. His summon seems essentially invincible and damage output is no slouch. I have a feeling the Primalist will be a beast, pun intended, moving forward. The Acolyte is very much your necromancer or warlock type character, and definitely looks the part too. Her skills range from summoning an array of undead as summons and spells to blasting off blood and bone ranged attacks. A curse, and it seems like an option for a melee type build is here too. Something cool is the ability to provide an attack command for your minions. Also one of her skills, Maro Shards, actually consumes life instead of mana. Which is an interesting option as loss of health is... well we'll get into that in a bit. But overall, her casting in combination with her curse absolutely wrecks mobs and higher health enemies alike. Overall, the characters feel very good to use, with the mage and primalist being my personal favorites. 
I'm incredibly interested in how these mastery classes will play out. Most of the character animations are very solid as well. Everyone feels unique in how they engage and interact with their skills. They all have their own stances and standstill animations as well. Nothing seems over-exaggerated, repetitive, or stiff. However, there is something a bit off about some of the run cycles, in that their stride does seem over-exaggerated and is kind of throwing me off. This might be because it seems like all the characters have a very similar run cycle, in that the same stride, arm swing, body position, and speed were replaced on basically all of them. It's a small thing, but it is more noticeable on some characters, and you do miss out on adding additional personality to the characters via their respective animations. And as your run cycle is a giant portion of the game, I'm a little surprised that wasn't implemented in a more exaggerated manner. In continuing on with the characters, let's check out their skills and passives. And almost immediately, your regular attack will swing its first dozen times, then never be used again. As you auto unlock your first seven skills within your first seven levels. Which I had thought, and still might think, is a bit too many too quickly. Interestingly, the Primalist gets his 7th at level 10, but in getting into the skills, I understand the idea of introducing several variations of skills to get an idea of what mastery path to follow. And when getting into the specializations, oh my god. So you, all this is, all this is for one skill? No. I was seriously taken aback by the number of nodes for each skill, with seemingly incredibly robust directions to take each one in. You gain specialization experience for using the slotted skill, and when it levels you get a spec point to assign, which is pretty cool. Some nodes require a few points in its prerequisite before moving on. Some of the nodes can wildly change the way your skill functions, such as turning Fire Orb into Frozen Orb. The customization potential here seems grand. The ability to easily and freely respec your point assignments, or swap it out to a different skill completely is quite welcomed. As you level, you'll also gain additional starting respect points for when you do swap out a skill, which is a great incentive to dance around or provide a mulligan if you specialize into something you're no longer using. Now unfortunately, I do have to knock something here. The skill bar is absurdly limited with the number of skills you can use. You can swap out skills easily enough, but with some of the more situationally useful ones like wards or dashes having a click 2 cooldown, it basically nullifies the point of swapping to it in the moment when you need it. Actually, I might want teleport. I'll get rid of no. Okay. Oh, shit. Ah! Maybe I'll be fine with five as I go on, but I really feel like limiting the approximate 20 to 25 available skills by max level down to five might be a massive unnecessary hindrance. I get there's only five specialization slots, so add more specialization slots? It's honestly a bit of a shame as almost all the skills feel great to use and are quite lucrative when needed in combat. I'd like to use more of them. Not all of them, obviously, but an extra slot or two for some additional customization might have been nice. Getting into the passives is essentially where you permanently increase your attributes. Life, mana, damage, resistances, bonuses, and so on. You receive a passive point when you level and also completing certain quests, including side quests which is a great incentive to explore those extra areas. All of the passives seem fairly straightforward, with no one passive node being so circumstantial you almost never see its effect. At least not yet, anyway. There does seem to be a solid amount of choice here in where you want to focus your character, be it tank, damage, melee, casting, summoning, or anything in between. Lastly, every X number of points placed unlocks a new skill, which seem to be your beastly skills. At least for the mage, anyway. Not exactly sure what these skills are called, though. Passive tree unlocks? I'm not... I'm not sure. Regardless, the passive tree is great so far, providing a wide range of choice. Alright, in getting into the gameplay, there is a lot to like here. I mean a lot. The UI and movement is very snappy and responsive you go to and attack exactly where you want to. Environments are great to navigate through with obstacles blocking shots, or lack of them allowing for that distance. And being each character feels so unique, each playthrough felt just as unique. Apparently there is the ability to block with all weapons, which I suppose I like.
There's area chests and shrines all around with a good amount of variation, including a gold shrine, a water shrine for mana regen, a haste shrine to speed you up, and a stun shrine, which was almost never useful. You will auto pick up things like gold, health potions, and crafting materials when you click on just one, which is nice. Your town portals are infinite, which I guess is standard today. Health potions only drop, but drop immediately when you have an open slot in your belt. I've gotten to four slots so far, and they are all bound to a single key. And the amount regenerated is based on math. It regenerates at 5x your character level, plus 50. Which I guess is fine? That's to be tested further. I haven't come across any mana potions yet, which is a bit odd, as every character uses mana. Maybe I just haven't found a belt that holds mana yet? That's also very interesting, you can go negative mana. As, like, a safety net or something? I'm not sure how I feel about that one. Speaking of, your mana and life regen is absolutely insane. They speed back up to full amount within a matter of a few seconds. And I'll get into how I feel about that shortly. Regardless, I'd still like some mana potions. The enemy engagements have been great so far. All the enemies feel great to battle with, and with all characters. Smaller mobs are knocked out with ease, while larger mobs cause you to rethink or regather for a second. And there's plenty of champions around for some added mob challenge. Something I really like is the number of ambushes you come across, where a group of Ospreks will swarm you, or two groups of warriors converge at the same time, including a mix of enemy variation as well. It makes for more active engagements, and actually caught me off guard a couple times. Mini and regular boss fights require your attention. They actively use skills and spells against you, and their more powerful ones can be quite devastating. Some definitely took some time and effort, however some I absolutely blasted through, but that might be a mage thing. All the animations look very solid. They all have distinct attacks, distinct behaviors, and their death animations are very satisfying. The Osprex sometimes ragdoll pretty hard though. It is interesting that enemies respawn when you return to that area within the same game. I suppose it's fine for the sake of skill grinding, but there was one time I completely forgot to trigger the objective, returned to do it, and had to fight my way back all over again. I have to say one thing quite bothering though, and maybe this is a hot take, is I absolutely despise having a red outline glow or highlight around the enemy I'm attacking. I do not need this. This is what your cursor is for, and I did not see an option to disable it. For me, this removes a large chunk of battle immersion as I'm glued to the red highlight instead of what the enemy is or looks like. And a heavy potential downside to enemy engagements moving forward and circling back to your health regen is I think I'm noticing a blatant lack of overall danger. My health did get low a few times, but I had to either be swarmed or get nailed by a heavy boss attack for it to get there. And this was only the case in the first areas. As a matter of fact, as my mage ventured forward into the ruined era, enemy engagements became increasingly easy. Again, maybe this is a mage thing, but in getting through those areas and bosses, I was simply obliterating them. There was essentially no challenge in this area, which I sincerely hope does not become a running theme. Well, that was ridiculously easy. Though, I am happy to say, the gear is great so far, both in how it looks and functions. We'll get into looks later, but everything has straightforward and realistically applicable affixes. There are no uber specialty circumstances or lines of text to read, plus strength, fire damage, plus health, cast speed, stun chance, etc. You can easily compare and contrast different gear in min-maxing, and with such a fixed variation making regular appearances in gear, they offer a solid amount of choice in what playstyle you want for your character. Also, there are uniques! With each having a specialty design and affixes seemingly tied to that one item. Some affixes can be a little specialized and wordy here, but definitely a welcome addition. I do know there are legendary and set items as well, I just haven't reached them yet. Something odd I noticed is the incredibly small threshold in weapon attack speed. 0.92 is considered slow, but 1.06 is considered fast? 
So that's a threshold of 0.14. Just seems kind of strange. Also, there is no need to identify items, nor is there the option to swap weapons. I thought I'd miss both, but I'm actually not sure I missed either. As the ability to see and compare dropped items to your equipped without picking it up and opening the inventory is pretty awesome. I didn't miss weapon swapping per se, but I also might have enjoyed swapping to essentially a different playstyle on the fly, namely with the rogue. Rare items can start dropping pretty early on, but I'm happy to say you aren't showered with them, at least not yet, and some magical items can still compete with rares for usefulness. But normal items seem to border on completely useless almost immediately. Items do not seem to sell for very much either, granted I might not have a full understanding of the grand economy yet. I do like the amount of and variety of buffer equipment, with your relic, idols, two rings, an amulet, and potentially an offhand and none of it requiring inventory space either. I'm not sure how we feel about the Tetris-style unlock system for the idols yet, but that's to be further explored. Overall though, the gear is great. I found myself making comparisons often, and saw the affix differences in real time. Absolutely nailed it with the gear. I'll briefly touch on forging, though I haven't dived deep into it yet. But from what I've experimented with, it seems very straightforward, which is a good thing. Forging allows the ability to add affixes to gear that have not already been maxed out. Magical items can have up to three affixes, and rares can have up to four. And uniques can have affixes added to the ones they already have. I'm not sure how sets and legendaries work yet, though. There are also glyphs and runes to apply to your craft both of which offer the ability to add, remove, or replace affixes, though most appear to have randomized results, which seems a bit dangerous. Overall though, forging seems wonderfully straightforward and provides great flexibility and customization. In checking out some of these menus, let's stick with the gear theme and start with your inventory. And first off, there is a solid amount of space in here. I absolutely enjoy that items take up different amounts of space, adding a sense of weight and tangibility to them, as opposed to every single item being the exact same size. It's very well organized and all equipment slots are large enough to appreciate how the gear looks. Crafting materials are consolidated into three categories and shared across all characters, which is very nice to avoid unnecessary micromanagement. There's even an inventory auto sort, and transferring materials is oddly satisfying. And let's go ahead and collect all this. Whee! There is a blessings menu, but as it's all locked at the moment, I'm assuming I don't get into that till much later. Overall, inventory is great. Your character screen is basically your stats menu. There is nothing to assign here. It is a little strange that you do not acquire permanent points in some fashion to increase attributes. As far as I can work out, added attribute points are solely based off your equipment. Everything is laid out very well though, leading to easy to read and easy to understand attributes and stats. Granted there are a lot of stats, but I was never lost nor found it difficult to find what I was looking for. Overall, very nice. Now I have to give a whole rant's worth of credit to this stash. Its deceptive robustfulness might be an unsung hero here. It's all shared and has a good amount of space. There is also the ability to purchase additional stash tabs for in-game currency, which is awesome. You can also add entirely new categories of stash tabs, to which you can then purchase additional tabs for that category. And with the navigation arrows present, I'm assuming you can purchase a lot. Though, I'm assuming for leagues, these will all need to be repurchased? I'm not quite sure about that one yet. There's also the ability to customize your tabs via icons and color coordination. Maybe this is in other games and I just haven't seen it yet, but this stash is seriously underrated magnificence. Stashes are found in towns, which also have your general array of NPCs, including a merchant, a gambler, and a passive point respecter. Granted, not all are found in all towns. And gambling might be tough, as you can only gamble for that one item once. Once you buy it, it's gone from the gambler's inventory, and I did not see a way to reset his inventory. Best of luck! The settings menu offers a great amount of customization potential, from the ability to completely reconfigure your bindings, to an incredibly in-depth loot filter, 
which might actually be a second unsung hero here, where you can highlight drops by rarity, class, and even by specific affixes, which is pretty insane actually. However, again, there is no option to disable enemy highlighting as far as I can tell. Also, I do not see an option for the duration of dropped item text. I suppose it can be minimized via loot filter, but it would be nice to have a toggle option, or at least change the view duration. Lastly, I have to say the RBG keyboard flash for low health is a pretty cool concept. I can't use it because I'm basic, but I like the innovation at least. The main map and mini map, however, is where I'm thrown for a complete loop. The mini map is easy to read with icons being large enough to stand out but not be overbearing. There's a zoom in and zoom out. You can change from mini map to map overlay, which is great, with options to change the overlay zoom and transparency. It can also pan around the overlay map. Strangely though, these options are not available on the minimap itself, only on the overlay. I would quite like these options on the minimap as I generally don't use overlays unless I'm grinding. The main map, however, feels immediately cluttered with text and icons all over the place. Not to mention markers for waypoints you haven't discovered yet, and other markers for places you can't even waypoint to, seemingly never to return there. So why have a marker there? It's just a giant black hole at that. I actually got legitimately pissed when I got to a point in the Ruined Era and saw almost the entire map's worth of icons, text, and route markers have appeared. Why is all of this already shown to me? Why can't I discover it on my way there? I WANT to discover it on my way there. A great alternative maybe could have been to have an Elden Ring type approach to map exploration, where you begin zoomed in on your start location, and the map gradually zooms out the more you explore. I actively despise having all of this shown without exploring it. Firstly, it utterly kills the art and visual of the map. Secondly, stop holding my hand! I find it difficult to believe anyone would actually need route markers. While we're on the subject, I honestly would have liked to have all of the eras hidden from me until I first jumped to them as well. Why can I see all of the eras and maps for those eras out of the box? It almost seems like they wanted to throw everything at you all at once which really takes away from the initial sense of wonder, curiosity, and excitement of the unknown in massive portions. It is honestly quite disappointing. Lastly, you can apparently fast travel to any discovered waypoint from anywhere in the world. Which is fine, I guess, but what's the point of a town portal then? Anyway, I would have liked to have the option to hide some of these map markers. Overall, the menus are very nice, both in layout and design but they kind of oofed it by overloading the main map with so many icons. The story and dialogue give mixed feelings. From, oh, this sounds interesting, to, what in the shit is going on? There are some very interesting overarching aspects so far. A rogue demigod, the keeper jumping in time to save the future. Looks like things didn't go well, so it's up to you to win the day via time travel mechanics. I think. But as far as the who's, why's, what's, and where's, I'm quite lost on. Same with the map issue, they seem to throw too much at you too fast. Maybe in an attempt to hook you in, which unfortunately comes across as a bit convoluted. I would have liked a more slow burn introduction to the character's story and events. I found it difficult to keep track of names, titles, and why exactly I was doing what I was doing. And some events are quite on the convenient, if not contrived side. Starting with the opening letter to you, who was this messenger? Why was he carrying a peace talks invite to me? Am I a known negotiator? Grail mentioning the burnt family you come across, but not elaborating at all? Uh, was it, was it his family? If it was, he got over them pretty quickly. Belfast joining you to destroy a whole bunch of enemies, then gets taken by Orion without even attempting a fight, only for you to go immediately destroy Orion and rescue Belfast. Balthus talking nonsense before you time jump. I feel as though drastic times are upon us. I, I, I guess. I know. You know about them too. Why does Urza have a debt ledger? How are people in debt with civilized currency at the end of times? Sable 500 gold marks and two dozen rations. Deceit. Death nullified. Debt nullified. Oh, well, that's a plus. Gaspar giving Panion the all-important destiny-changing shard just to seemingly run off with it for some ill-advised act. I told him to wait. 
But he would not listen. You let him just take the shard and... I fear the void is manipulated. These are just a few examples. The voice acting ranges from good, including Belfast and Gaspar, to maybe a bit overacted and cringe, including Lena and Grail. Sorry, but Grail specifically is terrible to listen to. Thanks. Are you also here for the peace talks? I am. Name's Grail. Also, the dialogue options seem a bit pointless. I did enjoy the populated towns and areas, with different people seemingly doing different things. But many NPCs produce seemingly pointless or useless dialogue. Lastly, the world notes are interesting for the lore, but again can range from kinda convoluted to quite interesting. I actually found myself seeking Balthus' notes when you enter the ruined era. As Etera willed, but our goddess is gone. If she knew the state of the world. Granted, there have been some eye-rolling moments. Overall, I'm pretty intrigued by the story. I want to find out what happened to Belthus and how to stop the end times. But some of the dialogue and quest events are leaving me puzzled along the way. My knees. Such large creatures, those Hosbricks sure build a tiny cage. I wanted to do the art direction and level design last, as it is the longest section. And man, oh man. This is where some of the strongest aspects of the game, and unfortunately some of the absolute weakest aspects will show their colors. Straight away with some good. The level design is absolutely fantastic. Everywhere I visited felt different and unique, and were very much laid out in a way I would expect them to be. The gardens had long walkways with open areas and large plaza type rooms. The castle walls were more narrow in navigation with bridges and stairs everywhere, and the ruined era with its winding walkways and varying elevations. There doesn't seem to be any procedural generation, so every run through will have the same layout. Granted, those layouts are very well designed and very fun to run through. Something that can be difficult to do properly is thoughtful and detailed asset placement, which I can say is wonderfully executed here. All of the areas felt very populated, without feeling busy. Almost nothing seems out of place or is added simply for the sake of something being there. All the assets feel like they're intended to be there and blend into the environment incredibly well. Something else which will tie into the overall art direction, is I've seen some absolutely gorgeous environment backdrops on my travels so far. It's an extra layer of added background design that simply didn't need to be there but the time and thought was taken to create them just for something beautiful and creative to pass as you travel on. They're extraordinary to look at, very much appreciated. The stark contrast in design from the castle gardens and fields to the crumbling ruins continues to show great design range as well. And all of the design and placement is very well done. There are a couple small annoyances though. Some of the environment fadeaways and environment animations can become visible obstacles, as well as the area titles. Speaking of, the area titles honestly feel a bit overdeveloped. And help pop-ups in the beginning will prevent you from attacking over its window. I'll briefly touch on sound, which isn't my specialty, but overall the sound design seems very good here. Enemies sound unique and match exactly what they would look like. The battle sound effects are crisp and very clear. All my skills and spells sounded great and impactful, and all differentiate from each other as well. Even most of the character voices are quite good and diverse in range, which is to be separated from the dialogue. Though I must say, I haven't noticed much in the way of scoring yet. Aside from the main intro music, the first time I really noticed the background music was in the council chambers, which is quite good. Now the big one, the art direction. Out of the gate, the 2D art is beautiful. The detail and vibrancy on each load screen completely entrances me. And the intro cinematic art is just as wonderful. The 2D main character portraits in dialogue windows are absolutely great as well, and appear with vibrant personality. From Lena to Belfast to Gaspar, even Grail looks pretty good. In keeping with the good, all the inventory gear looks great flat out. Very creative and robust designs. Tons of detail. The textures and the reflections are absolutely on point, and even have a specialized font style. 
Some of the multi-material armors can look a little waxy or flat though, like the type of or intensity of the highlights are a little too great for that type of material, such as cloth or hide. But to be fair, this is an incredibly minute complaint. However, I do wish the dropped item text resembled the font on the item. I do feel like I'm reading a bit of a Microsoft Word document when a unique drops. But otherwise, the equipment is absolutely awesome. Completely nailed it. The skills and passive art is all stellar as well. The skill icons are all very well rendered and easily depict what they do in clean, crisp, very cool to look at art. And I sincerely appreciate having the icon unmistakably resemble the action of the skill. Which personally I think is heavily underrated. Same thing with the icons in the passive tree. The mastery art is absolutely awesome to look at. I thoroughly enjoy every time I need to bring up the skill or passive menus. Now, unfortunately, is where we get into some of the more poorly executed aspects of the visual art. Starting with the characters as an intro comparison. As wonderful as the 2D portraits are, their translation to the 3D model can fall pretty short. Lena caught my eye immediately and not in a good way. I mean, it hardly looks like her. I'll elaborate shortly, but in keeping with the character portraits, it seems like each non-essential NPC portrait is simply a selection of a random assortment of 2D character art, as none of them have actually matched their 3D models. And both the 2D and 3D non-main NPCs host a noticeable lack in detail, which can be quite jarring compared to the design of the main characters. But something about the textures and lack of pop from their attire almost gives off a sort of lifelessness about them, particularly when zoomed in. And this is where things take an unfortunate turn, with the 3D textures. They are absolutely hit or miss, and when they miss, they miss hard. The characters at the select menu miss incredibly hard. This can be considered an extension of the in-game models as I refer back to their lifeless depiction. The mostly singular reflections and lack of depth in the gear made them look like plastic action figures. The Primalist is a particular offender of this. A portion of it might be due to the lack of facial movement. The Sentinel and Acolyte include jaw and or eye movement, while the Primalist, Rogue, and Mage just stare forever into your soul. There's also a strange sense of blurriness on much of the gear. And much of the detail comes across as quite flat, in that the detail within an individual piece of geometry looks meshed together, like it was simply painted on while excluding things like definition lines or normal maps. The Sentinel looks better, but likely because of the overlapping geometry on his gear. Don't get me wrong here, everything is very well designed. There is a wonderful sense of variety and creativity here. But I mean, come on. How does the texture of the tree bark next to them have so much more depth and detail than the tree bark on the Primalist gear? Or all your character's gear for that matter. The environment textures basically replicate the character textures. Some are very well done, the flooring by far and large pops very well and provides a sense of depth all around. The 3D models overall have an immaculate sense of attention paid to the design, color schemes, and placement of basically everything. Granted, I think the model fidelity could have benefited from a few extra polygons. But unfortunately, several textures are very much an eyesore, and some even stop me dead in my tracks. It seems like some of them may have been compressed to oblivion in resolution or otherwise blurred somehow. While others were allowed to have their great depth and detail, I understand the objective of optimizing in polycount and texture resolution for the sake of saving memory and file size to run the game smoother, for instance, how something like World of Warcraft has to be. But WoW is like that because it's absolutely open world with zero load screens, granted a few exceptions. This is not that, seemingly not at least. Not to mention the game was running as smooth as butter, with all settings maxed and no noticeable stalls, skips, or tearing. And with the option to turn settings down or off completely, I have scratched the hair off my head wondering about some of these choices. What the hell is this? Is this literally just a blackout plane on top of this geometry? Now, do graphics and fidelity matter? Well, that's debatable. But I think what's not debatable is consistency. Consistency matters. And unfortunately, there seems to be a noticeable lack in the consistency of texture quality. Also, I'm sorry. 
this town portal looks awful. It just, it's just a black hole with a skinny blue outline. It has a slight effect when you hover over it, and you can only really see it when you're zoomed in. I mean, ugh. It's just not very nice to look at. Now to reiterate, the design on almost everything is fantastic, with some areas looking very well detailed, but others seem to have either low texture resolution, or maybe their ambient occlusion, bump, or normal map missing. I'm not quite sure. Something else strange is the health and mana globe give off a sort of plastic or frosted feel instead of a clear glass type material. Maybe they were going for that? But the highlight reflection spread looks way too large and too dull to mimic a glass material. And with no highlights or shadows on the bottom of the globe, it looks completely flat against the statues holding them. Which makes absolutely no sense being the statues for the orbs look great. Wonderful highlights and shadows giving them life and depth, completely missing from the globes. Which is even more confusing with the fact the in-game effects are absolutely fantastic. I mean, they're great. There's tons of environment effects all over, from falling leaves to rustling grass and trees, to the fires in the forest and burns on the ground, which all look so good. The fire in particular, I think, is absolutely S-tier. All the boss effects and attacks look fantastic as well. And the spells. Oh my god, the spells. Everything elemental is awesome. The skill and spell effects on all characters look so damn good. Like, so good. Which is a huge reason why they feel so good to use. Not only that, but each skill presents as much effect as it needs to do the job it needs to do. No more, no less. They all create a massive statement while also being wonderfully refined. Unnecessary fireworks are annoying as hell, and I'm quite happy to say I'm not losing my character within my own skills here. And I have to pay homage again to those backdrops. They are simply wonderful additions. Dare I say awe-inspiring. By far and large, the overall art direction and level design is really quite fantastic. Particularly the level design. But there are certainly some rather jarring texture quality differences in geometry. Sometimes literally right next to each other. However, when all the cool stuff is going on, with the level design, environment, skill usage, enemy engagement, and equipment management, most of it usually goes completely unnoticed. Usually. And finally, I came across a small array of bugs, glitches, or otherwise oddities of sorts I felt might be fun to highlight. Stabs are considered two-handed weapons, but are only held with and used with one hand. You can't change from a one-hand offhand combo to a two-hander without unequipping one of the one-handers first. I tend to be a bit of a fast clicker, and there were several instances where clicking on an item did not register clicking the item. Somehow, my sentinel lost his helm for a while until I equipped something else. Accidentally moving your cursor into your inventory while scrolling the Forge Affix scroll bar exits the menu. When you meet up with Grail and defeat the miniboss, he says, I'll see you in town, but then proceeds to follow you into town. But then when you get in town, he teleports to his area. And then after you talk with him, he somehow teleports to Lena in that same area. His teleport seems much better than the mages. Speaking of mages, if you're firing off spells, you will shoot right through enemies if you're standing too close. When continuing my mage, I returned to where Belthas was stolen, and to my surprise, he got stolen again. But this... this has already happened. Uh... He already... he already got him, though. There was an instance where the dropped item's text was quite offset from its item. Then another glitch happened where a bunch of items decided to not attach to their text. What is with... what is with... what is this? What is this? Every time you enter the world from the character select, the title screen will flash up. If you've just swapped a character, where you just were with your previous character will flash instead. Just kinda strange. There were many times highlighted items would get stuck in the corner of the screen and would remain there until I pulled up another menu. 
And what is up with the missing images? Both in the main map and on these items? Where's the JPEG, bro? So, last epoch. What are my initial impressions from a Diablo 2 point of view? Well, there is definitely a lot to like here so far. I mean a lot. The characters and their skills are great to use and feel right at home with a Diablo playstyle. Enemies are all well fleshed out and with quite the variety of skills and attacks. Mobs range from cannon fodder to challenging and bosses are aggressive with plenty of unique encounters. Equipment and gear are near perfect, straightforward affixes that make lucrative differences in combat, and is all mostly very well designed with a great amount of detail. As are all the menus, from the inventory to the character menu to your skills and passives. They're all very pleasing to look at and easy to read and understand, except for the main map as the amount of clutter is just short of maddening. I wasn't too sure about auto-unlocking skills, but the incredible amount of customization for each one seems to offer tons of choice. Stat increases are via passives like in Path of Exile, but was easy to adapt to being they essentially mimic assigning stat points. Increasing the actual stat points solely based off gear though is an interesting option. I think I might want some more agency in that. Forging seems very cool so far and I'm looking forward to customizing more gear though the random results with glyphs and runes might produce some hesitation. The story does have me intrigued, but I feel a bit disconnected from the NPCs around me. So far, the level design and layouts are very well thought out and great to navigate. I am, in general, very pleased with the overall art direction. Granted, you're not getting the gothic realism, but the designs, animations, color schemes, definitely the effects, and general creativity are awesome as well as being very appealing but some of the texture execution is absolutely jarring, and by far and large is my primary complaint. However, a couple other things might have me concerned moving forward. First is the skill bar. Limiting my 20 plus skills to 5 might upset me later. I'm also hoping the ease at which my mage is having falters sooner rather than later. I enjoy beasting, but I also enjoy some challenge along the path to getting beastly and I sincerely hope I'm able to look past some of this texture work. I really do. And please, please let me get rid of the enemy highlighting. But otherwise, there really is some absolutely awesome stuff going on here. I'm looking forward to my masteries and trying different builds, how the story pans out, what the end game is all about, and grinding for as much gear as possible. If you made it to the end, my sincerest thank yous as this turned out to be much longer than I anticipated but I felt the need to cover as many points as I could. I'll likely get a couple characters pretty far into their masteries and then see about an update. If you enjoy these initial impressions, consider hitting that like button. I'll also be releasing my full run-throughs with each character to level 8, so if that sounds fun, remember to subscribe so you don't miss it. And if it doesn't, remember to subscribe anyway as I'm working toward more Last Epoch and other ARPG gameplay analytics. Thanks for watching and I'll see you on the next one. Adios. Smash, 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 Hulk smash.